to people's homes that then can get out of it. And and when you start having things like, you know, 50 people on a Zoom conference call, you know, those issues come into play. You have to instead build up a lot of, I mean, you do need some amount of infrastructure on the, on the back end and make it work. But if the pipes themselves aren't good enough for what people need to do, uh, that's an issue. So that's going to be a big policy, I think, by coming up in the future. Oh, there it is. Oh, sorry, Todd, you're there. Yeah. <laughs> I was waiting. Sorry. Were you, were you there for a while? Only about 30 seconds. Okay. I was Kevin, trying to see who was speaking, but I couldn't. Kevin, finish what you were saying. Sorry. I was just calling Ted on the mobile phone. Oh, hi, Jim. Here's somebody I knew. Hi, aloha. <laughs> well, you know, and until until network connectivity to people is, is the same same bandwidth going up and down we're not going to it's it's undemocratic to leave <laughs> things as it is basically and you could say immoral uh, adsl is apparently has to be asynchronous um, for it to work so unless you go to real broadband for every, i mean anyone on dsl they're never going to be able to get parity upload to download. So, the but I mean, eventually it'll, it'll die out. So I'm honored to welcome uh, Ted Nelson, founding pioneer of our online world. Uh, the web and com the web and all of computing today implement only a portion of what he conceived over 50 years ago. Wow. And a core part of his vision is around micropayments and business of copyright. Models. No, that's not the core. That is that is one flank of it. I said a core. Oh, okay. Right. A core. I missed the article. Yes, a core part of this vision. Yep. Um, which is what we'll discuss or focus on tonight, uh, especially in terms of how that might compare with the advertising-driven model of today. Well, let me uh, let me begin <clears throat> by uh, with a little orientation. First of all, I was I was a a movie maker and a media guy. Uh, my mother had a weekly TV show. I gave a name to a national TV show when I was in high school, and my father was a movie director. He offered me a, a career as an actor, and I'm very sorry I didn't take it. But uh, when I saw computers, when I took, pardon me, I never saw a physical computer. When I took a computer course and saw from the brochures and catalogs that you could put interactive screens on them, I said, holy shit, that's, that's, there goes the ball game. That's the new, the new home of the human race. The interactive screen will be the new home of the human race. And that was long before anybody else could see that. Uh, I would explain it to people carefully uh, for the next 15 years, and they would say, is it like a tape? And I should have just said, yeah, it's like a tape. But, but the notion of new interactive media, new forms of writing where you could jump from one page to another, uh, were obvious to me, and the system I designed, which, alas, got uh, busted very near the gate, was, well, it's now called Classic Xanadu, and you can, you can see, it. if you go to, if you watch my video, Xanadu Basics 1A, which is only 12 minutes, it's very clear and comprehensive. The point being is that the medium I envision would allow you to create not just individual pages, but pages with links, visible connections between texts, visible lines of connection between texts. <clears throat> not only that, but it had a, <clears throat> a system of payment and copyright built in. Specifically this. You created a document as a collage of other material. If it included things you had written, it would point at those things you had written, but you could point at anything else and it would be included. So if you placed a royalty payment on your content, let's say one one hundredth of a cent per character, someone clicking on that page would receive everything that was free and then have the option of 
paying the, that amount for the part that wasn't shown. Uh, this is entirely fair. No, but not only that, if you included content by someone else, which had a royalty, that since that ro since the document is a collage of pointers, that content would be brought from that author's cache and carry, and they would get paid for that portion of the document that they had created. So it's entirely fair and entirely uh, straightforward. And there's even a permission doctrine that goes with it. If you look up trans copyright, which is a name that I gave it in the 1990s, the trans copyright permission document says, I give anybody permission to use this content in any amount, provided that, they, that, they, that it is brought from my server. And you could implicitly include a requirement for micropayment on that. So it was a well thought out system for rewarding everybody. Uh, the point is, you know, I knew the history of media. Uh, television arrived when I was 10. Before that, I'd been a radio junkie and comic book junkie. And uh, I knew the history of the printing press. I knew the history of, of, of how the different, of the history of motion pictures. First, you had the kinetoscope that you had to crank, then, then, the, then you got 16 frames a second, then they added sound and they added color. And so all of these things were successive waves in the development of media of which the interactive screen was manifestly the manifest destiny. And so how to use the interactive screen was my quest. And for 20 years, from 1960 to at least 1980, I keep saying, you know, soon we'll have interactive screens and uh, you'll be able, they'll, they'll respond to you and you'll be able to put anything on them and you'll have automatic copyright management and da da And then the person would say, is it like a tape? So I mean, yeah, it's like a tape. So the point is that, uh, that people could not imagine these things. And then when Berners-Lee created the web, all you have is a single page. You can't have side-by-side -side connected pages, which is the text medium I was trying to create and still want to create. I don't know if I can find you right now. Uh, well, my collaborator in England, Edward Betts, has created a wonderful infrastructure that allows creating parallel hypertexts. And uh, we have a beautiful example. About 50 years ago, one of the greatest writers in the English language, Vladimir Nabokov, wrote a book called Pale Fire. And it consisted of a long poem by the fictitious author John Shade, which is a very beautiful poem, and the asinine commentary on this poem by a fictitious idiot author named Charles Kinboat. So Pale Fire consisted of a poem which the author himself ruined with this side-by-side -side crap. And I wrote to the publisher, was it 50 years ago? I, about 50 years ago, and asked if we could put this into a hypertext system, and I got permission. 73. Yeah, that's almost 50 years ago. Might have been 70, yeah. So I got permission from the publisher to do this, to put Pale Fire on a computer screen. I was working with one of the first text, online text systems. It followed Engelbart's, but it was the Brown University Hypertext System, and and I was gung ho working on that. Unfortunately, uh, I got very badly treated in that project. But anyway, um, I got permission from the publisher, and then last year, or two years ago, almost fifty years later, 
my collaborator Edward N. Betts finally put fail, pale fire into an online hypertext. And I would like to show you that now, but I, I, wasn't, I didn't look for it before signing on. And um, if, 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 if you'll just talk among yourselves, and I'll go looking for that right now. Okay, so. You're muted. Okay, I'm fine. Ted, I was saying that if um, if you send me the links, I can share it with everyone here. Right, but I don't know if it's working. Uh, and I should have done this beforehand, but it did not occur to me. Sorry. Um, In the meantime, if if you got why don't you why if, why don't you take the time and look at Xanadu Basics one A? It's ten minutes. Well, right now I don't think we have you can't you don't you can't spare the ten minutes. Okay. Well, I mean we've got forty five minutes. Yeah. Left. All right. Well. But I mean, what I what I will do is send around the link. I'm yeah. Sure. Well, you you just Google Xanadu Basics one A. That's that'll do it. Okay. So and Jim just shared side by side documents. Shared a link for that. Um, but, but I mean, at it, least the people in the class have read and and seen enough. I think they have an idea of, of the visible links. Nope, it's still not working. He said the other day that he'd get it up. Okay. Okay. So, um, well, this visible links doesn't quite say it. A medium of a new kind, a, a new kind of document, of which side by side panels with visible bands, visible stripes, visible lines between text are available. You can annotate things now, but you can put it in the margin. But there's no visible connection. I want you to be able to point at a specific word, a specific paragraph, with a visible line. And that is impossible. Let's put it this way. As the browser has evolved, somebody could pro 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 possibly implement something like this in the browser. I haven't the, I haven't the technical chops, nor the will. And, uh, but, uh, but no one else gets it. It's, it's like for 20 years saying we'd have interactive screens. Is it like a tape? Nobody gets it. Because people don't, they haven't experienced it. Hello, I can write a science fiction story and put you on, a, on another planet. And you, if I'm Ray Bradbury, I can make you feel it. But, but with all I've written and all I've shown, I haven't found Hardly anyone. Yes, I have among writers, among authors. They say they want it tomorrow, but the technical guys don't get it, because to them, text is a column. Yes, sir. Linear. And if, if and at best hierarchical. Can you talk a little bit more about the um, the importance of you know, within that is the. Payment system. Micropayments and copyright. Right. Well, the point is here. <clears throat> copyright was established what was Gutenberg? Something like 1453. And as printing presses multiplied, the ability to reprint something without permission of the author appeared. And so copyright was created. I, I haven't looked up the, the history, but it appeared, let's say, 100 years later, as a way for printers and authors, or publishers and authors, to be rewarded for what they did. Now, Shakespeare, there was no copyright in Shakespeare's day, but, but his plays were put on by his production company. And uh, uh, But as soon as it became as soon as the printing press became widespread, these things could be stolen. So I, I don't I don't know in what countries it began. I suspect England, but that's that's just a guess. And uh, 
and that was that gave a right to the author and or publisher to profit from a given document. Now, when uh, that was established in the United States, I'm not sure just when. Patents were established in the United States, I think, practically at the time of the Constitution. Uh, and I'm, but I'm not sure about the copyright law. And that, uh, and that has a definite expiration date, as it should. So that uh, I think... I think it was 26 years plus 26 years more renewed. So you get an, I think you get an automatic 26 years without filing. But if you... Hmm? I thought it was more. Oh, we can... But, um... Ishan, can you ask the, the question about... Um, so with micropayments... Can you ask that question about the, um, um, would it be per click, essentially? Um, yeah, so, uh, Ted, you talked about the uh, royalty payments, which would be done um, based on how a, a person like follows the trail of, um, similar to um, the transpointing windows. Yep. Um, so how does that compare to the Google AdWords model of the revenue model. Yes. No relationship, whatever. Well, but I mean, would would the person get paid, let's say someone uses an excerpt from my book. Right. And and, and you and you buy into the system. That's part of it. Right. But do I get paid once or every time someone... Every time somebody the downloads book? the characters. So... So the downloader is paying and the document is a collage of content, some of which may be free. I've never said you should, content shouldn't be free. I've only said that there should also be a right to charge for it. So, so if a document is a collage of parts that cost 0 .001, 0 0.001 cent per character and one cent per character, it will show you in each case, it, it won't bring in the ones you, you don't pay for. So you can either elect to have your... You can set your browser to only to pay automatically up to a certain amount. If you look at my video called New Game in Town, Google for that, you'll see a beautiful demonstration, which is done with Edward Betts's uh, infrastructure. It would be per click. In per no, user. it's not per click. It's per, per character. Yeah. The click... The click... Yeah, I mean designates an ongoing list, a collage. Then the list proposes to bring in the contents. All the contents which are free are brought in automatically when you click on the list. Any contents which are not free are then purchased according to the setting of your browser or at your particular choice. So the point, my point is, this is extremely fair. <clears throat> it lets it lets authors set their price. It lets everything. It allows everything to be quoted without negotiation. The negotiation is built into the trans copyright permission. If you Google trans copyright, you'll find that the latest the latest one is at Xanadu.com. If you look at Xanadu.com, there's a the latest statement of trans copyright. David. Did did you want to ask about any relationship, similarities or not, with uh, streaming music royalties? Or? Yeah, uh, while we were discussing that last question, uh, something that came to mind is how uh, platforms like Spotify or uh, anything else uh, that streams music, uh, someone pays a subscription fee, then based on their listening history, maybe a fraction of that subscription fee goes to uh, those particular artists. Uh, how would uh, other forms of media work under this platform? Well, first of all, in this case, the intermediary is remanding a small amount of the content, a small amount of payment, to the original authors. Now, Laurie Spiegel, my friend, who's a composer, has said she's never gotten a cent of royalties, though specific, though. <clears throat> though officially she should be getting them. Now, 
this what the streaming service is doing, if it's charging you by the month, it's entirely different. Because what I'm talking about is a la carte per serving. Again, it's 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 possible but unimplemented. You weren't it, thinking of subscription models, right? No. No, by the way. I mean as an option. No, because because it's a la carte. Every author gets paid per character, assuming that they put a per character royalty on. And uh, it usually means a flat rate for all viewers. It's not like the publishers are subsidizing certain categories of people. I you know, might say I don't agree with your political views. I'm going to charge you a million dollars to do it. That's my point. No, 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 no. I mean, it's it's it's, it's like a vending machine. It's like, it's like choice, a choice, right? That's, that's an assumption that there's neutrality amongst all users. Too. Right, hi, Rohit. Yeah. So the yeah, the point is that, that it's like a vending machine. I don't I don't know who you are. This candy costs twenty five cents. Yeah, yeah, of course. That there's someone. Hmm? Many publishers make special deals, and of course, this doesn't work with special deals. But but I, I mean, it's it's implementable today. Uh, separate from the from visible lines between panels, it would it's it's entirely feasible. And in fact, I got the uh, I bought the the domain royalty dot pub. Now dot pub is a, t a, a top level domain intended for bars and nightclubs, but uh, <laughs> but uh, royalty dot pub would be, seem completely suitable for for it. So it would be possible to implement this, and and we started. But then it looked. But then the EU started talking about responsibility of the carrier for content. So that that's entirely different from the safe haven provisions we had in this country, where the where the carrier doesn't know what the content is and and is not is not liable. But but given given that that would involve us in vetting the contents that 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 has nothing that's just not feasible for 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 me anyway but royalty.pub is there i'd love for somebody to do that and um joe did did you want to ask the about cryptocurrencies if they how they could or would uh them well, cryptocurrencies just add a level of complication. I mean, the 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 the, uh, the Bitcoin wallet is 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 a complicated card trick of many addresses, and uh, and so if what you want is anonymity, some of the cheaper cryptocurrencies might be good. Bitcoin, I think, is up to thirty five dollars a transaction or something. <clears throat> So, but but if you want what you want is anonymity, there are probably easier ways to get it. Cryptocurrency is is, is a very is a very strange world because, for example, Bitcoin is incredibly well thought out. It's still working nine years down the line, and. Uh, no one knows who Satoshi Nakamoto really is, although if you look at my conjecture, which has had 150,000 views, I think I'm right. But uh, it's not practical for small transactions, which the original white paper indicated it might be. You can make a Bitcoin transaction for a zillionth of a cent, but, but with a $35 overhead, there's no, no way to do that. And the, the others... Uh, Ethereum really puzzles me, and but but has enormous enthusiasm among its adherents. But I don't know anything that's working well besides Bitcoin. But was an I mean anonymity is etc. So oh well, yeah, and 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 uh, Bitcoin is semi anonymous because there have been a number of studies of of. That, in, that show who a number of prominent Bitcoin holders are, even though <clears throat> it's not evident from from the numbers themselves. Um, 
Dustin, did you want to ask about the advertising? How it? Are you there? Well, maybe not. Um, sorry, well, as, as I say, mine, mine is an a la carte model of payment, and and if you if you throw in advertising, that's that's just a. Uh, uh, can't think of the right metaphor. It's 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 a monkey on your back because it has nothing to do with what you're what you're what you're presenting. It's just it's just uh, uh, somebody you've got to carry around in order to pay for it. So how would advertising function if the world adopted that? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> It never it, it never interested me. Oh, you, well, you'd see an interesting ad, and and, and it would go, it would cost you zero, yeah. as they do now. And then Rebecca, do you want to ask about uh, evaluation? Um, Weed and child. Oh yeah. So I was wondering if you had any vision for um, a mechanism to evaluate uh, essentially junk from quality content? Heavens no. The power in some overhead authority. Heavens no. Heavens no. We, let, we, we, we leave that to the user. And if you send for a little bit and it looks bad, don't send for any more. You know, start reading it and it's, it's crappy. I, I, I was... <clears throat> Night before last, I was reading on reading some book on Kindle, a, a Kindle plugin for the web. And I said, "Why am I reading this?" And then I found out that I've been paying nine dollars a month for Kindle, which for a couple of years, which I didn't even know. And to 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 dissociate to turn that off took thirty clicks, but uh, uh, how do we get how do we get here? Well, I guess I was asking, for example, my sister tends to post that she dyed her hair last night and what she had for lunch and all this crap that no one should really need to know or want to know. And That's up to them. Stuff there. Yeah, we'll get away from it, but how do you find yeah, well, quality me, stuff within? Don't, don't, don't get anything more from that particular author. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I do that with... with, with People, people, a lot of people send me stuff. I try to be polite. I, ha I have an assistant who sends out polite letters. <laughs> and you um... I have a question. Okay. I have a question. So in a, in a system where everyone is able to sell they're what they have digitally. Mm -hmm. Well, we're, 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 we were talking specifically up. about characters, sequential characters. Even in this case, say write just writings. Yeah. Um, how how would one? I mean, in the sense that on the web, companies like Google have arisen to yeah. allow people to search, discover, and browse. When you say companies like Google, name two. Uh, well, there was Alta Vista. There was, um, oh my God. Space. A whole, whole bevy Yeah, well, the point is that there, there, there's no monopoly comparable to Google. Bing, Bing is still oh, about 10% or something. But, but <laughs> the need for some company to serve a function like Google to allow people to discover what people are selling to dis uh, or or some way you could say advertising but in the more general sense to publicize their works and to tell people uh educate them about them to allow them to discover them to preview them in order to buy there, there, there's the, in, there in, in, in the system I'm proposing, there's no preview. You buy one paragraph, you say, okay, that's enough. <laughs> but how would you know where to find the paragraph? They point at each other. Hey. <laughs> how do you know it's a good paragraph that you might want to buy? 
by looking at it. You, you've all, oh, okay, maybe the first paragraph is free. We talked about mystery stories where everything is free up to the ending, you know. <laughs> Actually, that's an interesting model for movies, right? You pay to, pay to see half, and if you like it so far, you pay for the rest. Sure. Or the way you do that now would be to post one and then charge for the next, but I, but I don't know how you get them out of Amazon. Well, I'm or, or, you, uh, mm -hmm. or use AI to generate the ending you want to pay for. It's like, I didn't like that ending. Have it, have a GAN go synthesize a better movie. I have nothing to do with AI. <laughs> I, 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 I like, I prefer RI, real intelligence. But is the idea that everything in this system is so relatively inexpensive that, in a sense, it doesn't really matter? Um, that, that was part of, <clears throat> part of the idea, yeah. If, if, if. Um, I, I guess at that point, like, if you read the whole thing, you end up paying the full price for that book. Yeah. But if you just want to read part of it, you don't have to commit to the full price. Yeah. You, just, you, 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 you nibble along and drop it when you're tired of it. So it, it's a model. So, so anyway, so, so call, this, call this the Zen of Payment model. And it, it's very straightforward because since a document is a collage, can be a collage of stuff from different people, each of these could give you access so here's a par here's a paragraph from some from another document and, you, and it would have a link to the document it's from, for instance. So you follow along in the way that you most like. Now I, I spent a great deal of time reading stuff on the web and uh, especially Wikipedia, but uh, it's uh, you know. Some of it's junk, some of it's too abstruse, uh, some of it's really fascinating. Right, as uh, mentioned here in a comment, uh, uh, they're saying there, it seems there, there would be a role in this system for uh, the equivalent of literary critics, reviewers. Sure, and, the, and, the criti and what the reviewer does is say, is it write an essay with quotes so that if you want to follow it to the original, you can. What's, what's frustrating about mo reading most reviews is that you can't click and follow it to the original. Well, Ted, right. you followed the Internet Archive's attempt to, to make Wikipedia link directly to text, right? Yeah, that's great. But uh, Ishan, you had a question about fair use, I think. Do you want to ask that? Um, yeah, so uh, with, with fair use, uh, they, the uh, the user is able to um, suppose in a teaching environment uh, able to uh, cite some amount of material for free um, but so how would it play out in this context so I think you have answered like some of the material would be available for free right nope in fair use and um, this is a point that I've argued with them at the EFF they say, well, fair use ought to be able to use some of it. All right. How does fair use work in the, in the real world? Somebody buys a copy and copies some of it out. So an original purchase was made, of which the quotation is fair use. So in this system, somebody reads something, purchases it, copies it out, copies out a reasonably small portion, and can republish that. That is fair use. But just as in today's system, in order for you to make fair use of a document, you have to have that document. So you have to buy a copy of the book in order to make fair use of a paragraph from that book. Same thing here. So then how do you feel about the Internet Archive? I mean, for instance... I love it. You can go straight to the excerpt for this course, actually. I assigned a number of readings where people go, you know because they've opened it up during the pandemic. Right. Well, that, that, that's, that's, going to the that's book, Brewster for you. That, that's Brewster for you. He's just suspending. He, he's, he's using the pandemic as, a, as an excuse to suspend copyright. But effectively, the person who wrote the book gets nothing from that. That's right. 
And, and, and right. as a rule, obviously, in the conventional publishing system as it existed till recently, the author got a small royalty per books sold. Now, well, I self-publish on Lulu, and I get a very small royalty for each book that's sold. <clears throat> and uh, so much is, and, and Brewster, as I say, is, is just suspending copyright for the duration. But he, he doesn't really believe in it. <clears throat> and, uh, I'm, um, I can't recall just off the top of my head, um, you know, any discussion uh, we've had in the past. I'm like, what would be the financial model, like on the Xanadu side? Like, you know, what would pay for the electricity and keep the servers running? Oh, sure. Pay for storage and, and so on. Well, we, we originally, now actually, Xanadu, Xanadu Classic was very special because it existed before the internet or, or rather before the URL. So when Tim Berners-Lee created HTML, that wasn't the real, that wasn't as important as the fact that he created the URL. So before the URL, every call to every server had to use the protocols of the company that manu of the operating system of the company that made that server. So if you were getting something from a from a Sun Microsystem server, it had one protocol, and when you're getting something from a from a, uh, uh, a Microsoft server, it had another protocol. And somehow Tim Berners-Lee was able to unify these protocols through the URL mechanism. And that's and I hand it to him for that. That is, and I've said to him, that's 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 your real achievement. The rest would have happened. HTML and HTTP aren't important. They would have happened automatically, and he agreed. Because before the URL, there was no decent way that a simple-minded user could find things in all in this labyrinth of different operating systems. I don't know how we got here, but that but it's a key point. <laughs> oh, sure. Yeah, I guess I was sort of asking, you know, um, you know, what your thoughts were on, you know, like how um, whatever entity was operating the. Oh, oh yeah. So make enough money to keep the lectures. I know, I'm assuming it would be like you know some percentage on transaction, right. or perhaps a monthly. Oh, sorry. <laughs> monthly. I was thinking hourly, <coughs> but excuse me. All right. Bless you. Hey. <coughs> so, um, yeah, I was thinking hourly, <coughs> but you realize we designed all this <coughs> in 1970. Nine, I believe. <coughs> so it was way ahead. <coughs> and Roger actually designed it so that he created his own internet, so that if you connected to one server, it would connect to all the other servers. Excuse me. Hi! Yeah. Hey! Yeah, I'm not infected, I've just sneezed. Okay. So um, <laughs> you can't catch it. Yeah, come through Zoom, yeah. Right. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, that the 1979 design was not only a hypertext design, <coughs> but it was a federation design for federating many different servers. And I, I, <coughs> that, I that was just recently brought to my attention. I hadn't really, really realized it. But a lot of credit goes to Roger Gregory <coughs> for managing that development. And if I hadn't screwed up in 1988, we would have had it out before, <coughs> before HTML. <coughs> but that was a political problem. And so uh, <coughs> Roger was committed. Excuse me, I've got this. I'm having a sneezing fit and trying to talk to you. So, he's talking about Roger Gregory. Yeah, Roger was committed to having a version up in 1988, and Autodesk bought the project. But then a programmer came to me and complained that Roger was throwing things. And without asking Roger his side, I had him demoted. <clears throat> so he was throwing things because 
he was determined to meet that 1988 deadline. And we would have had classic Xanadu out before the web if I hadn't screwed up. So while the web, no doubt, would have prevailed, at least everyone would have, would have seen connected pages, vis visible pages connected. And so that is that that the loss of that referent referent being able to see that is crucial. And again, please watch New Game in Town, which which makes this very clear. And then, was your intent that um, like all of the the backend servers would be operated by a, a single company, or did you? Have oh no. I was going to franchise them like McDonald's. Okay. I, I actually thought that I'd be the Ray Kroc of... of uh... Literature. Yeah. <laughs> In a sense, I thought I'd be the new Gutenberg. Little did I know that Gutenberg went bankrupt. <laughs> That's true. But, the, um, but didn't the... I mean, originally you were thinking of the franchises, but that's when you would have had to provide terminals. I mean, it did yeah, yeah. The point is, you you, you PCs were common. It shifted around. So. Right. So you so you you'd be able to pull up a chair at one of the Xanadu stands, and then later dial in. So, on the other hand, the internet was gradually coming along, but this was way before the internet. Can can you talk about um you know because one of the topics we've covered in the course along the way is multimedia. And, you know, I've said that it seemed even before the, it was easy to do technically, it seems like most people were really pioneering hypertext. And that even goes back to pre-computer, like sure. and people like that. Were very, like very who? Interested like in who? Combining who? who? Like who and people like that? Uh, Paul Autre, the, the Oh, oh well, no, he, well, he was, he was just a, operating a, a a mail-in information service. Right, but he was also experimenting with uh, audio, early TV, etc. This interest in multimedia seems to go really with hypertext. I know that you started off as much with hypermedia as text. Sure. But can you talk about how the royalty, I mean, how would the payment system differ, or would it? Same way. Multimedia content. Same way. You pay for what you get. How, how it would be priced, I don't know. The buy the character model is very simple. Buy the frame. Buy the rolling sec running second. All that works within the model. Yeah. Um, but you had originally started off wanting to do video more than Mm, I wanted to be a movie director, but that was separate. I, I was, a, that. I was very that. much a writer. Okay. And and I felt that techies didn't understand writing, which I still think is true. Uh, and, uh, <clears throat> see, the, the, uh, the stuff that was around in 1980, so the tech software in, in 1980, they, they were outliners. Well, an outliner is assuming a hierarchical structure. Now, hierarchical structures are used by techies. But if you look at a New Yorker article, it's structured on a through line. You have a zinger at the beginning and a zinger at the end that matches the beginning. And then you have a, a, a series of steps in between. And that is the, the through line model of writing is, is much more widespread, is, is the humanist form of writing, not hierarchical. <clears throat> like text. Now Doug Engelbart, in his system, his stuff was hierarchical because he was he was technical, and that and technical writing tended to be hierarchical. That was one of the little disagreements between us. I saw Doug's system in 1966, two years before his the great demo. And I really liked him, and he kind of half offered me a job as a programmer. But it was clear that I wanted to do something else, though I had the greatest respect for him from the very beginning. And, and we got to be dear friends. I mean, he, he performed the marriage ceremony when, when Marlene and I were married in 2012. 
I remember you telling me that his system was all about collaboration, whereas you didn't have as much faith in, I guess, people uh, working together. You were more interested in empowering the individual. Right, and being able to have multiple drafts. I mean, I have, I have no objection to collaboration, but, uh, but it seemed to me that the that collaboration tools should be built on things that an individual needs, which is the ability to have multiple drafts, and, to, and, and for me, to, to actually show lines between them, I'd like to have alternative drafts where you see lines between corresponding parts, for example. As I say, please watch New Game in Town when this is over. Uh, can I ask you a question? Um, so um, I was wondering how the, this paid mechanism would be able to compete with the advertisement mechanism that, that is very popular today. So when people see that they can see a lot of free contents, they kind of hesitate to pay for the contents nowadays. You're asking me how a previous model would fit in today's ecology. How the hell do I know? That's a good, uh, yeah, that's a good interpretation of that. Uh -huh. So, uh, do you think that there's a, uh, there's any way that today we can fit this model in? Well, as I said, <coughs> we we can do it with the uh, with uh, uh, royalty dot pub. It's just that I don't feel like taking the risk of offending the uh, censorship of the EU, and uh, and since. Edward was in England, which now is not in the EU, but that was a, that was a key point. Uh, that seemed a, way, a reason to, to stay out of it. But also, <clears throat> just the, the notion that now there's no more safe haven for publishers because we've seen how Facebook, for example, has been running horrible propaganda crap <clears throat> so that, so that the... the uh, <laughs> the service provider has to take some responsibility. And again, I'm not getting into that game. But it's it's certainly possible. If somebody wants royalty.pub to give it a try, <laughs> I'll be happy to relinquish it. I mean, I mean, uh, there's no question um, about, uh, uh, that, about the fact that that will increase the quality of content. And, and in fact, I think some of the publishers are... are, are uh, converting their uh, revenue models from advertisement to the paid model. I mean, different paid model, of course, is not a character based, but well, well, if it's character. even paragraph based, that's far from people. <coughs> people are doing it on a base of individual documents. I mean, if you go and buy books on Amazon, you're <coughs> paying for individual documents. But uh, but I'm I'm proposing that if you do it as a stepping stone model, where even selling it by the paragraph would would be a, would be in this direction. And I, I imagine that that would have its own um, audiences. Like, like probably, I, I imagine the general public wouldn't wouldn't use that very much. There today. is no general public. <laughs> like, there are there are constituent there there are, shall we say, herds. <laughs> there are the people who watch TikTok. <laughs> there are the people. Who, there are people. People who go to Wikipedia. I spend I spend hours in Wikipedia, and. Uh, and heaven knows, and there are people who live on Facebook. So there's no general public. There are these different herds that go off in different directions. So I read some fiction on the internet, and they're usually sold by the by tiny chapters of about two thousand characters. That's good. Who who's doing that? Um, Chinese uh, Chinese web fiction. It's a huge market. In there. Cute. Who is speaking? I don't see who is speaking. I see it. I'm not on video. Oh, I see. Okay. Good. But that's directly to the publisher, then? Well, it's probably to the service provider who may or may not be paying the author. Uh, the authors are being paid a fraction of what they get. Right. The question is, what is the fraction? <laughs> like about a third, I, I heard. Pardon? That the author gets a third? Yeah. That's amazing. But I mean, iTunes um, was supposed to be a third, two thirds, but it never worked that way. Uh -huh. um, but uh, Minitel was one third that the system took, two thirds to the service provider. Xanadu, what was, did you think about what 
Yeah, what would the percentage be that was well, that? It was a hundred percent to the to the author, and then a separate payment for the service provider. Okay. So in other words, you're paying you're paying by the hour of connection, or if you're sitting at a screen that you're renting, you're paying by the hour of that screen plus the connection, and then then the then the authors get all the get all the payment in that model. And it's a flat connection time. No matter that, what. That was the idea. I mean, we never got that far. No, because Minitel was an interesting model. I mean, it's sort of micropayment. I mean, I don't know whether you would call it micropayment, but you were paying a differential fee to connect to different services, what we would call sites. Right. You know, range from nothing to $10 a minute for, you know, either like investment information or sexy chat, huh. and weather and train schedules are free. Wow. Yeah, well, Minitel was brilliant, <clears throat> way ahead of its time. But you would have a flat fee. Well, um, uh, maybe it would be, probably I think we were contemplating. Hey, I think cost less in the middle of the night. <laughs> so of course, uh, to, to to try to keep everything occupied, balance balance the load. But again, all of this all of this is speculative, <clears throat> based on our thinking in 1979, and that is 31 years ago. Uh, Joad, you had wondered about whether, what is it, Starlink or other huge infrastructure changes, how that would... Yeah, work. so this SpaceX is uh, currently visioning to connect all the people of the world with their satellite and with low latency, low cost internet. Who, own, who owns that? Uh, SpaceX, uh, Elon Musk. Uh -huh. his startup. Uh -huh. So th they will be providing the infrastructure for the connections. Right. And, 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 and I was kind of thinking how, how that changes. And we'll the, just see what they charge. I don't know how, because obviously what they say now they'll charge is not going to be what they'll charge later on. <laughs> could not have happened with that. Who knows? You know, a bus business is business. You adapt to you adapt to, you, you lower the, the charges as you need to, or raise them when you can. Re Rebecca, you had a question about uh, other forums or? Sorry, I was um, thinking about, I mean, of course, if you know this, then we could all be billionaires, right? But what other forums would you envision that might allow individuals or small groups rather than giant companies to make a big impact on what we do online? Because there has to be an infrastructure. You have to select an infrastructure. Somebody with capital has to develop that infrastructure. And how that infrastructure is balanced for payment and whatnot, I don't know. I mean, by the way, I believe I was the first independent software developer in the world. So in 1960, I set out to build this thing, whereas anybody else who was trying to build software was doing it as a, an employee of a corporation or any, as part of a university. And I would say, no, I'm going to do this as a business in 1960. <clears throat> and so... Uh, I was thinking in 1960 terms of what it would come to be like. And so when, by 1979, we worked out that design and it took the whole summer of 1979. It was, I, I laid out the specs and Roger, as the technical lead, brilliantly figured it out. For example, I'd invented something called the enfilade. The enfilade, if you look it up in Wikipedia, they don't mention my name. <clears throat> but I invented it in 1970. It was a a tree for searching and delivering text with a minimum number of searches. So, th so that you would never move any text. You would simply change the pointers to it. And in the 1979 Magical Summer of Xanadu, the enfilade concept was developed into general enfilade theory by Mark and Roger and Stuart. 
So a general enfilade theory, an enfilade is a tree structure <clears throat> which imposes structure downward. That's widditive and something else, upward. I, I don't remember. <laughs> if you look on Wikipedia, enfilades. But the point is that it, it, there's a, a downward pointing structure and an upward pointing structure in the general enfilade theory. And then they were able to design enfilades so that the classic Xanadu was built on four enfilades, the span fillet, the three enfilades, the span fillet, the grand fillet, and the poom fillet. The, the grand fillet was a tree structure of all the content in the universe. The span fillet restricted that to the, con to the parts that had to be looked for in a given search. And the poom fillet, where P-O-O-M stood for permutation order of matrices, was an enfilade, get this, an enfilade of a tree structure of permutation matrices for rearranging the content. So it was damned brilliant. And all of this was worked out in the, seven, in the summer of 79. So I was concerned, you know, I presented the royalty issue, the issue of linking, the issue of quoting, and the idea was that any document would be from a bunch of quotes. And then a link would be on the content itself so that wherever that content was quoted, the link would be. And they made that all work within the design structure of span fillet, grand fillet, and boom fillet. So it, it, I was the instigator, and then I became a cheerleader as they worked out the details. It was a brilliant gang, five people. Roger Gregory, Mark Miller, Stuart Green, Eric Hill, and Roland King. And... Uh, and so, so, so uh, that was, you know, that was one of the one of the great uh, one of the one of the, the great incidents. The tape recordings of all our meetings exist, but I'm afraid they're lost at Stanford. <coughs> Throw it. You had. Um... A question about, um, I guess, perverse incentives with... Wrote, it seems to be gone. I see his name. Yeah. Wrote it. Wrote it. Wrote it. Wrote it. Wrote Wrote it. Well, I don't um, see any perverse incentives. I, I, the incentive is for the author to write stuff people will want. And the incentive for the service provider is to provide the service that people want. There's nothing perverse about either of those. Well, I've, and I'll probably get wrong what he was, um, but he was asking about whether, you know, let's say that somebody is, their content ends up being used by terrible groups, uh -huh. by hate groups or whatever. <coughs> would it be, would people know who was essentially paying them? I mean, they you'd, would you'd, you'd, always have, you'd always have the access. If, you, if you're looking at a specific section, you always have access to the, the initial context of that section. And of course, anybody can misquote you and, and put you in terrible stuff, but, that, but, that, but the system doesn't encourage that or doesn't give you any reason to do it. But if you start to get, let's say, that particular groups start to use your content more and you start writing more content that you know is going to appeal to them. Well, if, 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 if you're doing that, you're probably kowtowing to them, because if you're writing reasonable stuff, then, you know, if, if somebody, if, if some terrorist group quotes from the Federalist Papers of the U.S. Constitution, what's wrong with that? I mean, I think what he was getting at is, you know, the way today, if someone writes, you want to know who's paying for their research, who's, um, who's sponsoring them, would... I mean, that, well, but, but so that, 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 that's a meta question, but, but 
it's separate from the question of the validity of, of the contents. So, for example, I may read something from a, from a website whose point of view I disagree, we disagree with, but I can, dis, I can agree with a particular thing I read. But would it be, you wouldn't be able to tell who was, presumably who paid you for your snippet of text would be, I mean, that would be public or private. Wait. Wait. Oh, so yeah. No, you'd, 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 just, you'd just be accumulating the money. You wouldn't see what we would pay. But you could presumably there'd be a way to search and see where a particular paragraph was reused, and that would tell you who the audience was, in essence. I don't know if we had that or not. I think we did. But, you know, if somebody quotes me, if some terrorist quotes me out of context, I don't have anything... I don't imagine that I've written anything they could use, so. Yeah, and the fact you could trace it back to the original is yeah. a safeguard of its own. I've written hundreds of thousands of words, but none, I think, that would support any terrorist group. I think another scenario I've been thinking about is, um, you know, say you have a, you're at a page, that page transcludes a second page, that second page transcludes, you know, a third page. And no, 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 you're always happens. transcluding from the original. So you don't, you don't okay. step through the, 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 uh, the Okay, interview. well, anyway, I think, yeah. I think it still works then. So I'm transcluding uh, from an original and maybe I'm only bringing in, you know, uh, 20 characters, but, you know, on that particular page, that's a, you know, a dollar a character. Whoa. Kind of page. Right. Not many people. Not many people would click click on them for a dollar a character. Um, well, I guess uh, you know I could certainly you know I could imagine a UI where you know like if every single page where I pay I have to give positive uh, affirmation. You know that's just. But that's not that's out. not in our model. Uh, not in uh, not in whose model? I'm sorry. In the Zenodo model, you have documents. You have so you can look things up by document title, by author. And you can follow content, certainly to the original. I'm not sure about to all its uses. Right. Well, I guess, uh, you know, again, the concern I had was just, you know, somebody could, could set up a document that would seem appealing, but would, would have the sort of in an, uh, unexpected effect of, like, causing you to grab characters from a, a, yet a third document um, and thereby... Well, but... Kind of, but <laughs> defraud the person or, or cause them to pay more than they were expecting. Right. So you have, well, <clears throat> if, if suddenly you have characters for a dollar each, anyone should be suspicious. And, uh, and uh, you might stumble onto something you don't want. And, and, and at that point you say, well, I'm not going to go on in this thing anymore. And if, remember, if, if, you're, if you're doing this only, only a few hundred characters at a time, uh, uh, the, the damage is minimized. Right. But could you make the end of the detective novel suddenly it rises to yeah. ten dollars a character? Yeah. Well, <laughs> how, how do you feel about it? How do you feel about seeing that ending? It's like <laughs> like like the mouse trap. I don't know if you know an Agatha Christie play called The Mouse Trap, in which the audience is pledged at the beginning not to tell the ending, and uh, oh, but the ending is on Wikipedia, of course, <laughs> and. <laughs> Uh, and uh, but, but we saw that my son and I saw that in London. It, it, it's it was uh, quite grabbing. What's it called? Oh, the mouse. The mouse trap. Yeah. It was Agatha Christie. I think it only closed for this COVID night lockdown. So it, I think it's been running over fifty consecutive years in London. Opened in nineteen fifty-two. Yeah, there you go. So that's 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 practically that's like uh, almost sixty years. Pardon me, that's almost seventy years. <laughs> uh, a, a couple of um, questions uh, we talked about. And by the so the mouse trap, the mouse trap could very well have a, have a more expensive ending. And the question is, <laughs> do you want to see that? Yeah, I mean, Dick serial like the perils of Pauline or yeah. Dickens serials. I mean, it's kind of basically the same idea. Yeah. Um, one of the things we talked about in coming up with questions before, you know, is authoring. And in this course, we've talked a lot about 
you know, how the web lost authoring and how that's improved. The word way. authoring strike. Just it, I find the but, word um, authoring so repellent. To me, the word is writing. Editing. Writing. Writing. Yeah. writing. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I guess you could just write. Now, if you're making a movie, that's you're that that's a different thing. That's 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 direct. Then you're an auteur. <laughs> but but talk about authoring in in Zen because we've talked mostly about the consuming end, paying for it. But you know, how would what would that feel like? How would it work? Well, first of all, I will. I must at this point give a shout out to one of my pet peeves. And that is the horrible change of meaning of the words cut and paste. So for hundreds of years, until the Macintosh came out, cut and paste meant to cut up a manuscript and rearrange it on the table, on the bed, on the floor, all the pieces until you get it in the right sequence. Balzac wore a razor blade around his neck for this purpose. If you go to, well, I could, there's a, anyway, there's a wonderful exhibit, some of which is still on the web, called Brillon d'Ecrivain in France, which was pictures of the manuscripts of famous French authors, all of which were rearranged pieces. So when the Macintosh came out, they changed the meaning of cut to take this piece and hide it. And they changed the meaning of paste to take this piece that's hidden and plug it in here. And the place it was put was fictitiously called the clipboard. Now it resembled a clipboard in, <coughs> in this way, you could hold one piece of information. In no other way did it resemble a clipboard, but this was called a metaphor. So those motherfuckers, excuse me, at Apple changed the meaning of a vital writing process and took it away and gave us nothing to replace it and said it was the same thing. So if you look at my pages at archive.org, I've got some big examples of, it was in fact a manuscript I'd written and cut and rearranged on huge sheets of paper I'd had cut at the factory. And it, it was flooded in the, when the, when the sewers flooded in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1962, we get all smeared. And I've never tried to type it up, but it was a whole, a book length manuscript that I'd cut and pasted according to this method. And I still do that. Now, Tolstoy called it his noodles. What he would do <clears throat> is he would take a previous draft, which he had rearranged, <clears throat> and his two daughters would sit, and they would, and he would dictate from the one draft to another. And so they would make two copies, one of which he would in turn cut up, and the other which he would keep for reference. And he would lay these pieces out all around the floor of his dacha, Yasnaya Polyana. <clears throat> and he'd go for walks in the woods. <clears throat> and he would call back, don't touch my noodles. How do I know this? Because my grandmother attended a lecture by one of his daughters. So I think I'm the only source of this story now. But I still call it a full noodle draft when I print something out and cut it up and rearrange it, which I sometimes do. And that tool has been denied to us linguistically by the bastard, by, John, by Steve Jobs, saying he's given us something to write with. And if they just told it, if they just given it another name, like hide and plug, it would have been, it would have been reasonable. Control C and Control V, as far as I stand for, cram and vomit, because they pretend to be the cut and paste function which every author still needs and very few people know how to use. Although quite recently somebody sent me a tweet of somebody who said, gee, this is so hard to organize, I had to cut it up and put it all over my bed. Duh! <laughs>
That's how writing was done until 1984, that Orwellian year when Jobs changed the meaning of the words cut and paste. Actually, I did. Kevin commented just now that it was Larry Tesson at yeah. Xerox. Yes, I, 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 I'll ask Alan Kant. It, it was both both Larry Tesler and Jeff Rulison take credit for this monstrosity. <laughs> and 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 when when Larry died a couple of months ago, all of, everyone was praising how he had quote simplified writing. No, it was more complicated. He and I had, I could edit for publication. The book-length correspondence he and I had back and forth about this, because you know he he understood my point of view but resisted it. <laughs> Wonderful guy, but uh, as I as I say, I consider this this an atrocity, and it, it's the most fun. It's 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 the most fundamental atrocity of the computer field. They took away the writing tool we need most. Now today, you can at least on the Mac. Take a big text file and stripe a section of it, and then pull that section across to another text file. And by doing this successively, you can do large scale rearrangements of the kind I'm talking about. So it's almost as good, or it's 50% as good as having real cut and paste. But one of the books we read for the course was um, Paper Machines, which was about the history of. Uh, well, card catalogs in a sense, but you know, going back five, six hundred years, a lot of people were cutting up and reorganizing pieces of paper yeah. for just this purpose. Yeah. And it, you know, it's kind of the basis of hypertext that you can create rather than simply I mean, in a sense, you follow a cross-reference, that's like read-only hypertext. This was a way to create hypertext. Well, it's a way of creating any text by by rearranging I mean, a first draft is a first draft. My son and I read aloud to each other on the net, and, and right now he's reading to me Dickens' Child Hist Child's History of England, which is so horrible and so full of gore, I cannot believe that it was called A Child's History. But the thing is, it, it's obviously been dictated because he never rewrote. He, he does these orotan sentences that have the sound of a dictated system, so that Rewriting is about rewriting. Now, I'm, I've just pulled up here something called Brillant d'Ecrivain. Is there some way I can show you, show this, sh oh, show this to you. Share screen is on Zoom. Share screen on Zoom. Do I you share the screen or do you share? Us your personal to-do list or who. So hit share and then try to figure out which window you want to show. Uh, hit share screen. Okay, share screen. Host disabled attendee she screen sharing. Oh, how do I, hold on. Let's see. If you make him a co-host, you can have him then share. <laughs> co-host, okay. that sounds like the pandemic. You're now a co-host. All right. <laughs> Clickety-click. All right, so there we are. So there we are. Co-host is when you live with a host and get, get it from them. Right? Something like that. So this is a very beautiful book. Oh, which yeah. Which is uh it's and, and it's on amazon and uh only 350 holy smoke <laughs> one used from 350 grab it because it is so beautiful and it's it's all these pictures of oh that, that, that's not um, oh wow yeah yeah of, of separate of, of the different oh well the different um uh, uh manuscripts of these different of these different people so I've, I've lost you here someplace. Hello, hello, hello. Well, now I don't need to share the screen anymore. But I, I mean, people used to talk more about, you know, the giant, I mean, the virtual whiteboards are here. But I mean, it's like, again, why does people used to, with paper, I remember covering a wall with stuff. Yeah. You're not limited in the in the size either. That's the right. Screens are theoretically cheap enough to do start doing more of that. Right, but there's but there's no software that, that allows it. My friend Frode Heglin has something like it. I haven't looked at it. 
I'm trying to get through here. So cancel share stream. Yeah, cancel. So can can you cancel the share screen? Uh, I could withdraw co-host permission. Do that. But I still see your screen. Yeah, right. Mm, you are, oh, I, you can, I, can, I can. Oh, hold. stop participant sharing. Yes, I can. All right. Good. There we are again. All right. Um, I was a little so Kevin, you went to Hypertext ninety one when you saw Ted the first time, and uh, Jim, you were there, right? Weren't you one of the org? No. Hypertext ninety one. I hardly, you know, I I went to so many of them. I had I, I don't remember them. Maybe you can tell me where it was. Uh, was that in Seattle? Was it Seattle? No, really? no, Seattle was ninety three because that was my. First oh yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I went was, to 93. Oh, no, 99. sorry, it's 93 you went to, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I mean, what was the, this is really a question more for Kevin and Jen. I mean, what was the, how much did people connect at all or even understand, uh, you know, both Ted, but also some of the older hypertext? Um, I mean, Doug was around in a number of those. Well, well at he, that point, you had a lot of people that were dealing with systems that were based in hypercard people that were dealing with more systems that were on personal computers and not so much, uh, workstations or mainframes or anything like that. Uh, you had more of a literary crowd. Um, from my perspective, um, that were, that were interested in, low cost uh, apps that would allow you to create uh, stories, kind of like choose your own adventure stories, story like uh, systems and structures in a literary way. Uh -huh. So from my point of view, it was more that and um, not as much technicals and not as much people from um, the academic uh, hypertext, hypermedia background. I mean, they were there, but it was, there were two crowds. You, you kind of had a, uh, 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 the, the literary do it on, do it on the cheap, do it yourself crowd working on Apple Macs or whatever they had. And then, and then you had, uh, the researcher crowd and the two didn't really know how to talk to each other. <laughs> right. That was where it was at. Right. There's a, there's a, a classical piece which I've never actually read, Michael Joyce's Afternoon, which is supposed to be very wonderful. But oh, yeah. I, I never read it. I keep thinking I'll get around to it. And then I think Hyperdex 93 was where I first became aware of your work, Ted, because uh, my recollection is that you were one of the keynote speakers at the conference. And um, I have this fairly strong memory. I'm, Pretty sure it was from '93 that you you gave a talk, and as I recall, I think you had like four slides, and each slide had a year, and so I think you know the first one might have been you know 1960, you know five or six or something, and then you would you know talk around that time period, and then you would slap another year down on the on the overhead projector, and then talk to that for a while, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you were just sort of uh, incredibly entertaining, and uh, you know we're able to carry through this very. Uh, you know, the the story and the narrative about Xanadu throughout all of these, hmm. uh, you know, with with so few slides. And I guess for me, I think it was the first time I'd seen someone give just an extemporaneous lecture. You know, no notes, perfect command of material, like no looking at your slides to remind you of what you <laughs> did to talk about. And man, that certainly left uh, left quite an impression. Oh my gosh! Uh, yeah. So that was ninety three. So that was just the year after I. Taken, or Marlene and I had got together. She she made a tremendous difference in my work and life. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I guess my other impressions were like there was a, a conference reception at the aquarium, and I I remember it because I felt guilty eating the the seafood canapes in front of the the live seafood in the <laughs> in the tanks. <laughs> well, if if that's the one I remember, I, I remember that Jim Blinn the uh, Graphics guy was there, 
and I and I said, well, show me ray tracing. And he puts his finger down and a ray swims along underneath it. It's very good. <laughs> That's cool. One of, um, one of those videos I'll never find. <laughs> and then uh, and then I also had strong memories like, you know, we were demoing our, you know, open HyperDex system. And I have this recollection that you went through and you know, were, were making an effort to see a lot of the demos. And so I kind of remember... I had this recollection that you went through and did that. And I think, um, um, I can't recall, I think you were videoing and I think Mark Menard, uh, I think was also taking video of the, of the various demos. And so anyway, I kind of, you know, I remember the, all those videos are, are lost. Yeah. Yeah. Remember your presentation, you know, I remember demoing, um, I remember meeting some of the other students as a student volunteer. So yeah, I was, Oh, and I remember the T-shirt because I still have the T-shirt. It's huh. seen better days, but uh, but I hold on to it. It's my first conference ever. So wow, '93. Yeah, my first conference ever was fifty. No, no, no about sixty-five. Yeah, I went. I went Sorry. to something at uh, IBM Central. It was the first time I'd actually seen a computer display. I'd, I'd been thinking about them for five years. It wasn't made by IBM either. They were demonstrating it. Made by Streza, I believe. That must have been cool to well, finally was, see know, the thing you had been dreaming about for it, so long. Well, it was all caps. And, and uh, you know, did, did, I, did I mention to you, I, do, I mentioned this to somebody else today, uh, that uh, I made the mistake at the, I think it was the PC83 in Atlantic City. And uh, I, I, my, my book, Computer Lib, was a big hit at the time. <clears throat> and guys kept coming to me and saying, uh, those guys at the Apple booth really want you to come and see it. And I said, does it have a lowercase? And they said, no. And I said, not of interest. <laughs> Big mistake. I might have been an early hire. <laughs> Fired by jobs a year later. Who knows? <laughs> but at that booth were jobs was, and no, it was stayed in the hotel, jobs and Dan Kotke. All this is documented. Anyway. You remember for me, it was a big day when I got my 80 column card for my Apple II because that brought lowercase into my life again. So. 80 column card. You don't, you don't mean a Hollerith card. No, no. So this is a, a, hard, a physical hardware card that would give the computer the capability to do 80 characters wide. And how interesting that it was 80 characters wide, just like the Hollerith card. That's probably not uh, a probably, I, probably not a coincidence. I yeah, don't think it is a coincidence. I did read something about that. Yeah. yeah. So Herman Hollerith, and I think the Hollerith card was created for the 1980, the 1888 census, if I recall. 1890. 1890 census. I'm close, yeah. And uh, so this would, they had little pots of mercury and, and, and fingers that would do the counting. So they were actually using relays to, to count the census. Yeah, we have a reproduction at the museum, but it's not not a functional one. Uh -huh. but it's pretty. I I wonder, just from a purely UI point of view, with every all the techn technological change we've seen in our lives, some of us more than others. Uh, I wonder if everything that has been talked about uh, coming from such a hands-on experience of of creation that maybe maybe this such a system um may not maybe there's something about uh the combination of high resolution screens and in particular touch screens and touch screen devices that may serve as a foundation for allowing this type of system to eventually be used and, and what do you mean eventually we're using we're using interactive screens for everything what are, what are you talking about um in a but in a limited way in the sense that the notion of today's 
copy and paste is very different from what you originally envisioned. Cut and paste, cut and paste. Right. And, but, and but, where manipulating text and bits of text and selecting things with your hands, your fingers, both fingers at once, rather being removed from the screen with one on a mouse and one on a keyboard. Well, I, th well, I, th I think it can be done page. just as well. It, it can be done just as well with a mouse. It's <clears throat> the real problem is is uh, getting the software that does it. And uh, but writing I, with a pen, writing with a pen. No, writing with a pen on paper and then cutting it up, or, or pr printing it out and then cutting screen. it up and then writing in between and then copying and rearranging but, on the screen. But writing on a tablet. And then using your pen to flick a paragraph somewhere else. And I, and that's inconsequential to me compared with having the fundamental capability of major chunk rearrangement. To me, the mouse was wondering whether it would inspire people to explore to go back that direction. Well, if they're not inspired by now, they'll. Uh, uh, I wouldn't try to wake them up. Uh, everybody who's going to be inspired is go has al already been inspired, I think. <laughs> so they're, 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 but people weren't inspired by the web until people put images on it. Nonsense. When you say people, you mean more people were inspired when images came. Yes, there was okay. a certain segment of the population that were just, were just fine with it not having images. Right. But, but, but after but, that, but, it blew yeah. up. And this is spoken by the guy who combined multimedia on one of the earliest web pages. Are you saying that this fellow Kevin did? Yeah. Okay. But I mean, that <laughs> did. His site was one of the ones that people pointed to as a demo in 93, or the Hawaii oh, site. This okay. Was like, you know, you've got video, you've got te uh, audio, images, image maps. When, like when did video reach the web? Well, there were early demos done in uh, early 93, but it was a real pain. You had no uh, uniform codec. You had no uniform way of capturing video, of putting the frames together. You There's no way of synchronizing audio and video. Uh, there is no way to have a stable frame rate of video. Uh, so it was all very computer uh, workstation specific. Sun had its own video capture cards with its own software that was kind of cobbled together that you had to do. Roughly it. like roughly like the internet before the URL. It was it was all manual, roughly put together. Yeah. Now, and, by the way, and it was expensive, <clears throat> expensive and slow. Now you you and, spoke of you spoke of UIs, uh, which I find. An annoying term, but uh, but to me that has always been central. Uh, the tuning the feel of a of an interface. Now I've I've always said that interactive software is a branch of filmmaking, and that's 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 not an analogy. That is a meant to be a a literal statement. What is a movie? It's events on a screen that affect the heart and mind of the viewer. What is interactive software? It's events on the screen that affect the mind and heart of the viewer and interact and have consequences. So you are not, it is not fundamentally different from movie, it is super movie. <clears throat> and the same principles apply of making things look right, feel good, and come across clearly. Now I have I've I've got a little video on my channel, Ted versus the Media Lab, because <laughs> uh, I first met Nicholas Negroponte in 1970, and uh, we didn't get along from the very beginning. And the Media Lab, it seems to me, all right, to me the principles of interaction are very straightforward: making things clear, making things mentally clear, making them feel good, feel right, come across clearly. And those principles are universal. <clears throat> and the movie director is someone who masters all of those parts and puts them together. And the director of software is adding interaction and consequences. Well, and, and by the way, most 
interfaces stink because they're done by guys in the back room so uh, who who are who are techies so the media lab from its foundation pretended that the principles of interaction were mysterious so give us money and we'll show you amazing things so to me the principles of interaction are not mysterious they're absolutely straightforward and pretending that arcane demonstrations have any relevance is hogwash. So that's my overall position there. Now, Negroponte is a salesman and, 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 a, and a politician, and, and we hold salesmen and politicians to different standards of truth than we do ordinary people. So uh, you can understand that since his objective is to astonish and get money, that's what it does. Well, what did you think of the Aspen movie now? Because he was well, it's obvious. First big project. Yeah, it was, it was a good project, but that but that was obvious. It was, there was nothing mysterious about that. That was basically Google Maps and Street View, but what, forty years ago. Yeah. Running on a mini computer for a single user. Which is good. Yeah. With, with a laser disc. Yes, right. on laser disc. That was the coolest. Oh, that good old the, the good old laser disc. Time. Yeah, I threw yeah. away a couple of laser discs only recently. Oh, we can read them. Um, Not those. <laughs> They're in the. They they went in the dumpster a long time ago. Not anymore, I guess. Yeah, right. <laughs> Robert, I yeah, asked I mean, you a question for you. I don't know if I got it right. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was offline, even though I appeared online. Uh, go ahead. No, I did. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you. But do you want to um, just go back? Yeah. I was saying that it's about the potential conflict of interest. That uh, you know, if you end up getting paid a lot by unsavory groups, that it could start mm. twisting your uh, incentives. Is that well, right, or did I totally botch it? Yeah, there are so many dimensions to it. So I was having a side conversation uh, about Kindle Unlimited. So there's another model today that that resembles a small amount of like you know, okay, let's pay for reading or content. And these economies where a centralized party like Amazon's involved end up so far dissatisfying authors and readers because there's not the accountability, right? So there's one part of it was like, okay, who do you trust? Like either I have to give you a royalty statement that says, here's the identity of everyone who read what you wrote, which is potentially a violation of the reader's privacy. Or the direction is that we tell the, uh, uh, the people nothing, but price discrimination based on audiences or worse, content discrimination based on audiences is a reality you have to work with. So it might be like, you know, if certain neo-Nazi content is banned in Germany, you basically are saying effectively the, the access control or the price is such that I cannot let you read this if you're a German reader. It's not the case it's a vending machine where everyone is equivalent to the same server all the time. Yeah. So there's these complications about the political analysis of uh, micropayments and copyrights, which is that is the price really set only by the speaker? Is the price uh, listener dependent? How do you settle the payments in a way that doesn't have a party like an ad network or a Amazon in between that ends up being uh, putting a deaf ear or two abuse, you know, these uh, bots that just read all these Kindle books just to stuff the readers, stuff the, ro the royalty rates for their publishers, junk like that. Well, <clears throat> all you're just talking about the possible consequences of a Xanadu-like model in today's ecology, and that's... Uh... I tried where the seams would be even between an ideal Xanadu-like ecology and the regulatory and political patchwork we live in. Right, right. but, but the Xanadu ecology was designed before that, so... We can't. Correct. Yeah. yeah. No, we don't. And we don't know what the regulatory environment would have become had there been a Xanadu ecology. It mm -hmm. might have taken a different turn. By the way, what? this this overall video which I'm recording is a very good record of what I would like known about my work. Does anybody here object to my putting it online? Hmm. Well, Jim, you're really. Oh, well, there's both participants. Right. That, that, well, I want to know if, if I would need the permission of every participant, of course. No, and there's also the institutional ones, going back to exactly our point about rights and, and how they're managed in the modern litigious culture. So, Well, let's put it this way. If I put it online, I don't think the university is going to sue me. Jim, uh, well, I, personally, I have no objection. I guess video, people consenting on video is legally perfectly valid. Sure. But Jim, does, I mean... Does the university, uh, presumably, the, the rights go to the university, right? Well, since, since 
they can they can sue me if I put it up, and then I'll take it down. But yeah. but otherwise, uh, or they can somebody somebody hit me with a copyright strike. It was called and took down one of my videos. But but I objected and and satisfied Google that I was good, and they put it back. Oh, the DMCA take down abuse. Yeah. yeah, no, it wasn't DMCA. It was it was uh, okay. Google's own uh, G, um, uh, YouTube's own YouTube. copyright. Well, I'm not yeah. sure. Star Chamber. I'm not sure, but I think faculty have the right to their own work. Yes. So, as Mark being a guest faculty member, I believe he has. Yes. The well, I'm it, right. So I'm asking for permission to put this up. If any of you denies it, I won't. I have no objection, but I mean, do you want individuals to say? Well, does any individual object? Yes. Does any does any individual object? Okay. So I'll I'll put it up, and then if if anybody doesn't like it, great. Okay. Because because uh, it teased out. A statement that I had not made before about the Xanadu model, and I was pleased to get it, have a chance to think that out and speak it. Great. Which statement? I'm curious. Just a minute. <laughs> Sorry. No, no. The, the my exposition of the, the of, of the Xanadu model. As it evolved during this conversation. Now, I also just want, you know, we have Harvey uh, Lightman and. Um, I'm Sorry, I can't talk now. I'll go with you back. Harvey, what? Am I mispronouncing your last name? Lightman. No, yeah. you're close enough. Okay. <laughs> and Jake Feinler from um, NLS. And, uh, Jake Feinler, is she here? Yes. <laughs> Where? On the corner. <laughs> well, but everybody, the topology is different for each person. Oh, well, just raise your oh, hand. Jake, oh, for God's sake, hello. <laughs> it's been so long. It has. Yeah, yeah. I was just wondering if, you know, from the point of view of the other hypertext project of the, uh, it started the whole thing. Yeah. Well, of course, there was always Doug's, and, but he had, he had something different in mind. Because I was thinking of the individual author, and, and the NLS system essentially was intended to empower work groups. And he did a fabulous job. Well, Harvey right. and Jake, are there any, uh, are any of these issues ones that would have come up with NLS? I mean, how was well, no, because, because he, since he was thinking about work groups, he wasn't thinking about the public. And, and to publish meant to say, make things available to users of NLS. Because at that time, you know, I think they could, I was told by, uh, I can't think of his name, that, that, that actually only four people could stably use the system at once. And, uh, and, uh, and so the, the notion of putting things out for the public was not, was not even on the horizon. Well, that was very early on. Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, he showed it to me in '66, September '66, yes. which was very early. I, yeah. I was working was at Hartford. All caps. Hmm? <laughs> Later on. All caps. Yeah, all caps, definitely. And 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 uh, video, uh, yeah, five twenty-five line video, right? I mean, you know, we were just developing it in '66. Yeah. But then later on, there were a number of users that all around the country. Yes. And, uh, I, I felt very privileged to see it in 66, but I was absolutely sold on the mounts. Before that, I thought it would be light guns. Well, the thing that impressed me about Engelbart's system when I first saw it, and which was a hypertext system, I came from the library world uh -huh. where I was doing searching all the time searching, you know, the big, big compendiums of literature, right. uh, biological or chemical or whatever it was. And there was always a cross-reference. Then you had to go look up the cross-reference. On paper. And I spent many, 
many of my hours looking up cross references. And when I saw hypertext where it just pinged you right to the cross reference, I went, oh my goodness, this is great. You sure. know? That, and and I, uh, I think many of us used it to write. You know, we used it to write whatever. Sure. Not only technical things, but uh, there were several people who were writing books. They were writing poetry. They were doing their own thing because they had this system that they could do it on. Sure. That's great. Well, how many users did it eventually get to? Well, I don't know because, uh, see, I spent... Well, they left in 77 and went to Timeshare. I have no idea how many users they had at Timeshare. Uh -huh. But we had uh, we had groups of users that were uh, at various... Uh, uh, there was Gunder Air Force Base. There was... Uh, oh, what was the one up in... Uh, uh, Rome American Development. What? Rome. Rome. Yeah, Rome American Air Development. There was... Uh, ARPA, so we had users from all of those places, and then we had users that just heard about it and kind of wanted to creep in to see what the, huh. what the world was about, so there were a lot of those around. Right. I would say, well, the, the computer itself would only handle maximum 100 users, uh -huh. and then it was in total, you know, I mean, we, it would take five minutes for something to to happen on and when you had that many users. Right. So, but many times we had as as many users as the system would allow. Because when I, I I was at a meeting with Jeff Rulison three or four years ago, and he said that the most it would stably handle was four or five. I guess that was at the time of the demo. Oh so, yeah, Jeff mm -hmm. was. Computers were just minimal then. Right. They and this was the SDS 745. Mm -hmm. Jeff left the group uh, basically right after the first demo uh -huh. and moved around the corner to the AI group. Uh -huh. Oh, were you, were you in the team also? Yeah. I don't know your name. I was Harvey Leitman. I was there from 60... Nine, late 69 to uh, 1980 when I went up the street to Apple. Great. So the uh, so when I had the demo when he when I saw the demo in September 66, uh, it was quite amazing and wonderful. Now I put the pocket cards that Doug gave me. I think he gave, I got them from him somehow at 67. I put them on the Internet Archive. And they certainly, just looking at the pocket cards, shows the complexity of the system. And Doug's, Doug's, Doug's bicycle analogy, I think, misled him. So the idea is that a tricycle is easy to learn, but in order to get anywhere, you need a bicycle, and that's harder to learn. So that based on that analogy, the system got pretty darn complicated. And I think that was definitely one of the problems. Yeah, but I, I take exception to that. Okay. Everybody's saying, oh, it was complicated. Well, you could program on it. But you had to be a programmer before you could program. Sure. So if you wanted to learn to program on it, sure, that was complicated because you had to know how to program to start with. And then you had to learn that programming system. But I'm not talking about programming. I'm you talking about... to write on it. That was pretty easy. If you wanted to... You know, just get in there and, and put words on paper. You could do that. I did it, and I didn't even know what a com you know what the system was. Okay, so you're telling me that my impression of its complexity from the pocket card is misleading. My feeling was, frankly, looking back on it, that Doug made it too complex. You should have you should have looked at it as you can do beginning things, beginning, and then you can keep learning and doing more things and more things. Exactly. That would be my position. What he wanted was everything under one system. Yeah. That well, you didn't have to go learn this, and then you didn't have to go learn that. You didn't have to go find this, and you didn't have to see what little diddles they did that were different. Right. It would all be there. So that well, what I'm saying is that... For knowledge workers. Yeah. But it depended on what your knowledge was. If you're a physicist, 
you had to know physics before you could do interesting physics on it. Uh, so, you know, I, I think. Well, what I'm saying is, I think that, that it could have been made. Everybody that sat down in front of it wasn't going to be an expert. What I'm saying is, I think it could have been made simpler, without without sacrificing yeah, that's functionality. Exactly my feeling that yeah. it it wasn't presented in the way that you say here's here's what a beginner can do and you know work your way through. Exactly, simple steps upward. But Jay, yeah. you're saying that you didn't. It had all this complexity that users didn't necessarily need to know about. They didn't need to change the system, just present it in a more modular way. Yeah, maybe. There, 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 there were so many there character commands that you had to learn, though. So, so getting away from that so you could pick and choose from a menu, for instance. Yeah. Uh, there was a team of young women who went around the country teaching people in Air Force bases how to use the system. That's great. And well, that, that isn't that's much true. of an exaggeration. <laughs> but when I when I first got introduced to it... Uh, because it was so hard, you're saying hard. No, all somebody had to tell no, me... No, they, 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 they made it... How they it's laid out. It's laid out yeah. as, uh, in... in the way it was structured was not presented to me in a way that it made a whole lot of sense to me. It when was it was my I thought how it was structured. It was easy. Yeah, yeah. And, and you could start out simply and do things, and then continue to evolve. Yeah, and there's still things in it that I love that I can't. I don't have you know, like I could go if I had a paragraph if I was writing. And I had a paragraph, but I could see all my headers if I wanted to see headers. I could go down through layers of it and see layers of it. And that's difficult to do these days. It's doable, but it's not very easy. Well, the outline processes of the 80s, I think Max Think and a couple of other outline processors of the 80s did that. If, if, you, want, if you want a hierarchy, that's the problem. Because did, have I mentioned in this conversation that... that much writing is a, of a different kind, like a New Yorker article is written on a through line. You have a, 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 a statement at the beginning and a statement at the end that, that matches it, and then you work your way from one to the other. And, well, often when you write, you're, you know, you're, it's a, you're flowing ideas. Can't talk now, I'll call you back. Sorry. <laughs> and then sometimes you know you get off on a tangent and you know that's when maybe you would if you were talking as you did you would cut and paste and put it in better juxtaposition but what i liked about the fact that you could level clip is you looked at all your you know statements and whatnot and you could just look at the first first sentence of them if you wanted to and then you go oh i got <laughs> i really went off when you know this goes there and that goes here and you could just change all this stuff around. It was just wonderful. It was, and, you know, having come from the world where you dictated to somebody and you had three pieces of carbon paper and... <laughs> carbon paper! And, I mean, it was like, whoa, <laughs> I've gone to heaven and I don't want to go back. <laughs> forgot about the carbon paper. <laughs> and red and black ribbons on your typewriter. I never dealt with the carbon paper. It was always the women. <laughs> You remember the, the typewriter ribbons that had a red stripe and a black stripe? <laughs> you had to have a typewriter that would adjust to that. <laughs> well, there were things I liked about Engelbart's system and things, and some of it was because of the computer that you were on, where things that, some things that computers just didn't do then. And so it was, you know, but I thought it was a fantastic system to work on. And, uh, that introduction into actually interacting with a computer. I mean, it was just like the end of your hand. <laughs> and that was so amazing compared to what we had been doing before it came along. So it's uh, all of these things were just, you know, when you look at what was the beginning and what's now, it's, it's mind-blowing. Well, how, I mean, do you, how do you like what we have now compared to NLS? There's too much of it, and it's it's all, I mean, you have to know that it's there. Yeah. Uh, and then you have to learn how to use it, and then you have to know it's little idiosyncrasies. It's like Zoom. 
you know, everybody's like, well, how do we do this and how do we do that? There's no consistency, but then that's the world these days. There's not much consistency right. between. They add features rather than having them designed in the beginning. And that was one thing Doug really worried about was consistency in the, in the user interface because he saw it as, a, as one tool that, you know, would have a consistent user interface and then you could do with it whatever it was you needed to do or you wanted to do. And, and uh, that, that lost when we went to the little computer, we, you know, we went to, to Macs and PCs and all of that and then everything went off on a tangent. Yep. I mean, I've, I've said in the course that I think standards are the Achilles heel of computers. I mean, they, well, the Lord, as they, as they said in the Bible, the Lord must have made loved standards because he made so many of them. Right. So if you look at the, at the size of the, the memory and, and the, the capacity of a machine back then, a million dollar machine did very little. And when you look at what they programmed in that machine, <laughs> it's amazing. The, mean, it the, the biggest amazing. hard drive of the, the biggest hard drive of ten years ago is is like this now. I know. It's amazing. I mean, I never, I didn't even know what a terabit was. Right. I had to look it up, <laughs> find out what it, you know, and I got a stick that's got a terabit of memory, terabyte of memory on memory. I can't even say it. Right, but most of it's wasted. In fact, and the, um, yeah, I mean the, I mean back in the in the sixties, my impression's always been that you know people like Ted and Doug could really you know think in broad terms of these integrated systems, which became harder to do once there were all these standards that you had to support or deal with or compete with. And once somebody's seen one thing, they always try to relate to it. So having seen nothing on the computer screen, I was able to imagine everything. <laughs> right, that's a nicely put. Because I, 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 I didn't actually see a computer screen. I did, <clears throat> well, I saw 80 column caps, all caps, five years after I, I learned about computers and, and uh, computer graphics, maybe 10 years later. So not being hindered by by, by some hints I'd already seen, I could just imagine it all. So, um, well, I think I came from a different point of view too. When people were building the system, you know, they were they were down in the nuts and bolts. I always said programmers were two faced. The really good programmers, and I and I happened to come up with a lot of them. <laughs> They could see the bits and the pixels and the little tiny thing, whatever it was they were dealing with, and they could see the whole picture. Yeah. And that just that always amazed me. I always thought that is an amazing accomplishment that somebody could see the, the picture of what they were building, and then they could, but they still had to get down and you know they were down in the nuts and bolts of of what they were doing. But they could see this picture of what it was going to be like, and I, I, I just thought that was a real talent that really, really good programmers had. That uh, was amazing to me. Still the case. The the, the programmers who have favorite methods, and then those who work backward from some. What's 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 the story? <laughs> a guy comes. I used to tell this uh, anecdote. A guy comes across a a uh, three guys digging digging a ditch, and he says to the first one, "What are you doing?" And he says, "I'm digging a ditch." He says to the second one, "What are you doing?" "I'm building a wall." He says to the third one, "What are you doing?" "I'm building a cathedral." <laughs> yeah, that's so all your perspective. Yeah, but when you think of good, great writers, they can both craft an individual sentence, a paragraph, as well as see the whole structure. I'm not saying it's the same. It's been overused, the, the analogy of programmers and writers, but there's some 
that macro and micro scale is there too. Well, I would have a, a, an idea of what I wanted, where I wanted to go, what I wanted to do, what I wanted the program, you know, a program to do. And then we would always talk. We just talk with the programmers. Would talk to me, and I'd talk to them, and they'd say, "Well, the computer won't do that," or you know, or they'll say, "Look at me, like I don't understand what you where you're going," and I wouldn't understand where they were going. But it was always it was always a team effort, right? Uh, you know, a concept, and then the the nitty gritty of it, and then how you were going to get from here to there. And it was it was exciting to do, and uh, I really felt like some of the programmers that that I knew or that I worked with were geniuses. Perhaps people. <laughs> well, I, we've been on this for now two hours. I think I better yeah, get going. I'm anyone who wants to. I just because we are recording it, and there's some great material. I'm kind of reluctant to. But I mean, I, I actually have to put the light on. Anyone who wants to stay, I didn't know it was that late. I will, leave the, um, I will leave the Zoom session on. Okay. Well, thank you all for listening to my stuff, and and I appreciate the the opportunity to <laughs> tell yeah, it. It's an interesting concept, Ted. I'm I'm still rolling it around in my head. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Roll well. So Good night, everybody. Thank you so thank much. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Stay safe.